Well, happy New Year, everybody. Uh, it's uh, New Year's Eve, and um, I've got a real treat for the paratroopers uh, today. Uh, many of you will know Sergeant Major Bill Cochran, who's uh, from Australia. Bill has a very strong uh, Rhodesian connection, and in fact is an honorary life member of the Rhodesian Light Infantry Regimental Association, uh, and also was in Inyanga with 3 INDEP uh, during the war. And uh, so, Bill, you have a fantastic story, an interesting story, both before, during, and after the Rhodesian War. So over to you, brother. Thank you so much. Okay, John, but I'll see if I can do a, a fair job. Uh, first thing I want to say, guys, is I, I'm not a fighting soldier of Rhodesia. I'm an Australian soldier who spent time in Rhodesia. And even in that short period of time, um, I, I I know who was right and who was wrong. Um so don't don't uh, don't throw bricks at me. Uh, I'm just trying to talk about my time in Rhodesia. But a little bit about, about me. My dad was in the British Army for 22 years. I was born in Gibraltar, and uh, for the next 22 years we moved all around the world: Malaya, Germany, France, places like that, uh, where my dad was posted. So I think, in a way, even though for a while in the in the in my 15, 16, I was rebelling, and I told my dad I'd never join the army. I think it was a, a foregone conclusion, but I expected to join the British Army. But one day, Dad came home. He'd been out of the Army for a couple of years, and he wasn't happy, and uh, he said, pack your bags. We're all going to Australia. That was 1971. He'd seen an ad in the paper that said they wanted uh, the Australian Army were looking for ex-British senior NCOs and warrant officers. My dad finished as an RSM for the Australian Army because Vietnam was on, and they wanted a bit more um, experience. So that's what happened. We packed our bags and the mum, dad and the five kids all came over to Australia. Um, three months after we got here, I surprised my father by saying, I'm going to join the army. And uh, he said, yep, no worries. So that was 1971. I did my recruit training at Kapuka where we all do it. I think I sent John a photo of me with an SLR that was bigger than me. Um, Went to Ingleburn to the Infantry Centre, did my induction training, my infantry training, and was posted to the 9th Battalion, the Royal Australian Regiment, which was the next battalion that was supposed to go to Vietnam. But uh, uh, they didn't go. The war finished. It was very disappointing for some of us, uh, or even though my Vietnam veteran friends tell me I'm lucky that it, it, it didn't happen. Um, I'd always wanted to jump out of an aeroplane. So while I was in uh, 9th Battalion, we were at, at our jungle training centre as the demonstration company. And uh, I saw an ad for uh, go skydiving. So a group of us on the weekend, we went out and we started jumping. So I did my first parachute jump in 1973. And uh, I always wanted to be a military paratrooper. Uh, it took a lot longer to get to that point, but um, I'm also a, uh, a military qualified parachutist or paratrooper. I'm a parachute jumping instructor. I'm a freefall instructor. And I'm also a... Uh, a skydiving instructor, and I instruct on weekends at the drop zone out near me, and I'm going back tomorrow to do another course. But um, yeah, parachuting is, is one of my passions. I'm nearly 70 years old, and I'm still doing the occasional jump out of an aeroplane. I jump uh, at Arnhem and Normandy for the commemoration events there, out of a Dakota, just like you guys. Uh, even though I had jumped to Dakota before in the military, this is a bit different because it's over a wartime DZ, and we all dress up as wartime World War II paratroopers. So, and it's not so much all that, it's, it's the occasion. I go to France and Belgium when I'm there, and I do the, all the battlefields and things like that. Um, I've got two kids. They're not kids anymore. One's married with two children. The other one's a parole officer for the, uh, I won't say, I was going to say Bungs, but I won't. The black fellas out at uh, Alice Springs. So they're good kids. And my wife, Judy, she's let me have the house for a while so I can, tell lies and she won't laugh at me. Uh, I did 47 years in the army all up, if you consider that I did 28 years as a full-time uh, soldier where I, I was trained as, when I went to Rhodesia, I was parachute qualified. Um, I was a, a mortar number. I was a MFC. I was a signaler, sorry, I wasn't an MFC till later. And uh, that's what actually got us on the trip. So I sort of swing into Rhodesia slightly now. I was down doing a parachuting course at uh, Williamtown. I'd meant to go to Rhodesia in 1976 with a mate of mine. He signed all the paperwork, he sent it in, he got uh, accepted, but then he went AWOL and went off the rails a bit, so he didn't go, so I didn't go either. Um, but um, 
in 1979, when I was doing a course at PDS, there's this thing on the radio saying that Australia was going to be part of a monitoring force or be part of a force to go to Rhodesia. I said to my mate, I said, I'm going to go there. And he said, no, you won't. So I cut a long story short, went back to the battalion. I hadn't been there for six weeks. And uh, one of the blokes said, oh, the CO wants to see you on Monday. And I said, well, I can't have done anything wrong. I've been away for six weeks. So I thought, I wonder. So that Monday... I was fronted to the commanding officer and he said, how would you feel about going to Rhodesia? And I just about jumped over the desk and kissed him. And I said, no worries, boss, that'd be great. So 10 of us from our battalion. It was 10 from all the battalions in the Royal Australian Regiment, plus, except for six RIR. They were overcommitted to Singapore and Malaysia at the time. Plus other attachments from other arms corps, like engineers and things like that, artillery. And uh, a few hangers on that just lived in Salisbury for about three months and had a great time drinking beer and chasing women. It uh, didn't go bush at all because it was too dangerous driving on the roads. So anyway, we all got together and it was about Christmas time, or November actually, and we were supposed to go not long after that, but you Rhodesians were blowing up bridges in Zambia and upsetting the very UN and the rest of them. So we had to hang around a bit longer. So we spent our Christmas pretty much lead up training at Inogra at our base, doing things like uh, contact drills, break contact drills, um, mine uh, field stuff like that, mine, mine incident drills, all that sort of stuff, and obviously first aid, because we didn't know what we were getting into before we left. We did have a briefing on the orbat of the uh, Rhodesian Army, um, but it was, it was fairly basic. Uh, they told us where everybody was, which brigade was here, and what was there. But we really didn't know what we were getting into when we left. before we left. December 21, they decided that, okay, things have settled down a little bit over there. The Rhodesians aren't killing too many people and blowing people up, so we might as well get going. So we jumped. Uh, I was lucky. I was on the 707. There was a group of blokes on the C-130, and off we went, and we stopped in Perth, in Western Australia, for a night. It was supposed to be for a night, and uh, during that night, a cyclone went through and killed Mauritius. And uh, so they said, oh, we're not going today. You, you can leave on the on Christmas Eve, we left. So uh, it might be the 23rd, can't remember. But we flew from Perth to Mauritius. Um, I don't know whether I sent you for any photographs of the actual hotel we stayed in, the Mandarin Hotel. It had been smashed by the cyclone. All yeah. the windows were broken. All the beds were bloody soaking wet. And there was no food because it, all the stoves had gone. We were sitting waiting for dinner. And we were sitting there for an hour and a half. So we all decided, bugger it, let's go in and see what uh, Port Louis is like, or Fort Louis, I can't, Port Louis, I think, the, the capital of uh, Mauritius. So a group of us got a taxi, went into town, and we were having a bit of a drink in a pub there, and uh, these white fellas come up and said, uh, what are you blokes doing here? You know, what are you, what are you guys? They're uh, Rhodesians. And we had all short hair, and we were all fit in those days, and uh, looked out of place. So I said, what are you guys here for? And we said, oh, we're here to go to Rhodesia for the monitoring force. And they said, oh, shit, mate. You'll be dead in a week. So we all <laughs> and we said, no, it'll take longer for that to kill us, mate. It'll take us two weeks to kill us. That was our sort of first touch with anything to do with Rhodesia, anything Rhodesian. Next day was Christmas Day. Um, we went out to the plane and the crew had done their best to make it look Christmassy. And they, we took off and they gave us two cans of beer each. And now I, I'm quite, I was quite a beer drinker in those days. But after what those guys said to us last night, I thought, no, I don't want to get off this plane, even though it's only two cans. We used to have a saying in the Australian Army, two cans per man, perhaps, all right, when you're out bush or whatever, and they give you a couple of beers. And I've never seen so many drunken diggers who supposedly only drank two cans of beer. But I wasn't going to risk it, so I gave it to me, mate. And when we got off the plane, we got to Salisbury, and this is where the Rhodesia part starts. Um, we got off a 7-0, um, went through a whole lot of administration, uh, got issued with a uh, CMF ID card, which I no longer have, unfortunately, and a few other bits and pieces. We got reunited with our, well, we were happy when we got our weapons back, even though we didn't have anything to shoot with. Um, but, you know, you used to feel a bit naked without your rifle. And then we uh, jumped on buses and went to Cranbourne to the, the transit lines at uh, RLI. We were met there by an RLI sergeant. He skinny racing snake he was, you know, and I think he was Australian. I think they they, they, they stabbed him for the, the duty because we were Australians. It was Christmas Day. So they said, you might as well go and meet them. And we had Christmas dinner. After that, we jumped in uh, vehicles. And I remember we jumped in a small Pommy Land Rover and off we went to Morgan High School where the, 
the headquarters of the monitoring force was located. And the reason I got on the trip and the reason half of us got on the trip, especially the junior NCOs, is because we were all regimental signalers. We'd all done signals courses and that was with the groups in the, in the bush and with the company-based teams. You know, I had to have someone responsible for communication. So we spent the rest of that evening going through the uh, the Brit, uh, I think it was a Klansman radio system back in those days, how to use it, you know, do this with it, um, the, the codes that they had, stuff like that. Uh, we didn't get back till about after midnight to our lines. And we've been on the go since early, early that morning when we left Mauritius. Uh, but while we were there, no one's going to sleep in that situation. You, you you don't know what's going to happen. It's the first time a lot of us had ever been in a war zone. We'd all been to Malaysia before, um, but that was a beer drinking trip, okay? Uh, as the rifle company, but I worked there, but this was the first time a lot of us had ever been where you know, people were shooting up people. So we spent the night getting our gear ready, and making sure our webbing was up to speed and all our um, cards and whatever that we had, our rules of engagement and stuff like that. Uh, we found somebody talc and we talc them up. And then we just had a chat till five o'clock in the morning. And the group that I was with, I was with a, a Royal Engine, a Royal Australian engineer, let's say, a lieutenant, Dave Craig, a great bloke, nice guy. First time I'd ever met him. And I was part of company based team 13, which if I'd have known at the time, I would have been upset about because I'm quite superstitious. Anyone that jumps out of airplanes gets shot at by people. It, it, most of the people I know have got some form of superstition. So I didn't know that till many, many years later. And him and I were set for three in the in the Yanga. And a couple of the guys, the Rhodesian guys, said, mate, that's pretty, pretty hot up there. There's, a, there's normally a lot of activity up there. So, you know, keep your head down. That's one of the things they told me while I was there. You never say good luck to anybody when they go back to the operational area. You say, keep your head down. Because if you say good luck, then he's buggered. And we, I looked at my boss and he looked at me and we thought, yeah, okay, well, we'll see how we go. So we went down to the, the revetments at... Um, Serum there, the, the RAF, the Rhodesian Air Force Base, and they gave us their ammunition. And we had an SLR and a 9mm pistol each. And they gave us uh, six magazines for the SLR and two for the 9mm. So we're sitting there filling our magazines, and this high ranking officer comes along and Pommy Bloke, I don't know who he was. Oh, okay, fellas, you know, what are you up to? Blah, blah, blah. And we're filling out our ammunition, filling our magazines, and where are you off to, and all that sort of stuff, small talk. And then we got on the plane, C 130. There was a Kenyan, um, I think they were a border crossing uh, mob on the plane with their Land Rover and shit, and there was me and Dave, and there was a couple of other people that were going to uh, Umtali, to the dock. And the you know, plane flew in at about 300 feet. I you know, didn't want to get shot at, and we are all sitting on there, and we are okay, because we you know, we'd all jump out of the airplanes flying at, not, not flying at 300 feet, but pack flying at 300 feet to go up to jump height. So we were okay, but these Kenyans were all spewing all over the place and we were laughing at them. And anyway, we got to Grand Reef and obviously the RLI Fire Force that was in there at the time, this was uh, the 26th of December, 1979. They all come down for a look, you know, you know see what's going on, have a bit of a laugh, you know. You'll be dead in a week and all that sort of stuff. Okay, mate, no worries, we'll see you. And this crocodile from... For our uh, that Wasapi picked us up, just me and my boss, and we had a heap of shit. They gave us a huge box, I mean a huge box, full of things like uh, even a teapot. The bombs had got everything down to the teapot and a tent and stuff like that, and a big um, retractable aerial for our comms. So we chucked all that on, and there was a an RAR um, African soldier there with his Mag 58. He was our shotgun. Zipped into him, Charlie, my boss, Went up to the jock there at the that's near the Cecil Hotel there at Mtali. They had a chat, come back out, jumped on. We drove up to uh, to Rasapi in the in the crocodile. Got there, you know, got a bit of a yeah, okay, no worries. This is where this is where you're staying. We stayed in a motel, and that was pretty much it. And uh, the CEO of Fort RR said, "Look, you might as well come to our Christmas dinner." He said, "Because yesterday we got called out and we missed our Christmas dinner. You know, we were out late." Slotting boots, he said. The first time I'd ever heard that. But I was like, okay, whatever that is, mate, no worries. So they took us, we had a, there must be only one motel in Wasapi, I suppose, but we stayed there. And we went and had Christmas dinner with the guys at the fort there in uh, in Wasapi, and uh, then we walked back to the motel. We had a 9mm pistol stuck down the back of our pants, you know, 
Tiger country, mate. You're, you're not going to leave a pistol at home when you've got one in your, in your pocket. And I said to my boss before we went to sleep, I said, sir, if you get up during the night, you better wake me up because if I see someone walking around here in the dark, I'll shoot him. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, well, we don't know where we are. You know, someone might want to come in and pop us off before all this shit kicks off. Next morning, we walk back over to uh, to Rasapi, to the, the, the fort there, and we had a briefing by the CO of Fort RR, who I believe he was a, a champion Rhodesian rugby player, and I think his name was Colonel Brown. I can't remember. Only uh, I had a chat with us, and he saw my para wings, and he said, oh, your parachute qualified. I said, yep. Yes, sir. He said, well, how many people in the Australian Army are parachute qualified? And I said, well, not many. I said, you've either got to be in a, a specialist unit or you've got to have a job that... Uh, that, um, that, that requires it, or you've got to know somebody. And he said, oh, okay, then he said, because a good percentage of our army are parachute trained. And I said, okay, no worries. Anyway, he gave us a briefing on what was going on. And uh, the vehicle from 3 Inlet turned up, and rather than a, a nice big bunny troop carrying crocodile, it was a Datsun, like a little bunny ute. And there were me and my boss and all the gear that only just fitted in the crocodile, the driver of the, the Datsun was a bloke by the name of Rob Page. Rob Page was uh, at the Int Corporal at uh, Three End at the time, and uh, and they gave him a shotgun, and it was a, a four RR bloke with a beard. And Rob put shit on him, saying, "Oh, he's one of those Salus Scouts. He's got a beard, and he wants everyone to think he's a Salus Scout." We still didn't know what they were talking about. We had a bit of a laugh. Yeah, I'm talking shit here. A long story short, we jumped in the dado, we squeezed in, and I mean we squeezed in. It was lucky that Dave Crago and I were skinny buggers then. And off we went. I can't remember how far up the road to Inyanga it was, but uh, car conked out. Engine overheated, too much buddy weight and all that sort of stuff. Too hot outside. So we pulled over the side of the road. There's steam coming out of the bonnet. I said, what do we do now? He said, well, you know, we just sit here and wait. And uh, I said, okay, so I've got my radio out. And I said, okay, this is, the, this is the crunch here. I need to see if I can do this, if I can work this piece of equipment. And I must have paid, a bit, paid attention the night before because I got it going and I got onto Umtali to the jock there. And I said, look, we've broken down on the road. How far are we? And he told me, I said, so many miles from, and I said, in Yangi at the time because I didn't know it was in Yangi. Anyway, they sent someone out to pick us up. The, the two I see are three in depth, Captain Sally Simpson. The ex SAS, I don't know whether he was RLR, I think he might have been, well, he was RIR at this time, but he had SAS wings. Come and picked us up in the staff car. They had a nice old Peugeot, Peugeot staff car. So we left Rob and the shotgun behind, and uh, he took us to Inyanga. We drove through the gates, pulled up outside the uh, company headquarters building, and he said, look, we're a bit busy at the moment, so, you know, can you hang back a bit? Because at the time... One of their platoons was in a contact at Julius Dale, chasing buddy picks through the, the sandalwood forests and all that sort of stuff. They'd, they'd uh, rob one of the stores for some beer for a Christmas beer drink. And they're having a bit of a decent size shootout, apparently. And you probably know one of the platoon commanders got killed by the name of Gus Detoy. We never met him, uh, but the day that we drove in was the day that he got, uh, he got killed. Anyway, uh, Obviously, at the start there, the OC, the officers, all the company hierarchy were, were wary. They wanted to know. They didn't know what we were going to do. Right? We were there to watch them. That was what they thought. We were there to spy on them and stop them doing their jobs and, and, and dob them in if they did something naughty. And that you know, we didn't know what we were supposed to do at that time. So we waited in one of the offices, and they were listening to all the shit going on in the, the ops room, and you could hear the OC calling for a spider, which I believe was your... your uh, your dust off, as we used to call them, to get the the officer and the wounded guys out and anything. So we, we just sat there and waited for a couple of hours and then everything quietened down and um, the two OC come and introduce us to the OC. Lennon Smith, I think his name was. Anyway, he gave us, okay, look, guys, you can you can have this office here. You can, you can set up here. So we spent the rest of the night, the afternoon and the evening. Oh, we went to the office to mess with us for lunch. Then we went back, everything had quieted down. And we spent the rest of the day in that night to about nine o'clock setting ourselves up, getting our comms squared away, working out where we were going to work from, what we were going to do. And about nine, my boss said, oh, come on, let's call it a day. Let's go. And I was in the sergeant's mess. And I said to the 
the two one six. I'm quite happy to, to sleep with the soldiers. And they said, no, you're not. And I said, okay, well, then. So they gave me a room in the sergeant's mess, or the senior SOS officer's mess at the uh, at E3 end up there. And I'm walking down there, and I don't know whether you've been there, but you know, up on the hill there, they've got the mess. Then they've got the corporal's mess and whatever. So I'm walking past there, and I could hear a lot of noise going on. I thought, shit, I really need something to drink. And I was talking about soft drink. I just wanted something to wet my throat. So I had my bag, I had my rifle, I had my pistol, and my money babbing and everything. And I, I just stuck my head in the door. And there's all these like, dirty soldiers, right? Cam cream on, t shirts and shit sitting along the, the walls having a view. And I stuck my head in the door and they said, Ah, you must be the Aussie. And I said, Yeah, that'll be me. Said, Get in here. So I dropped my rifle and everything outside. I went in there and they said, Here, have a beer. And uh, we were chatting away and the night went on. And I think we finished about two o'clock in the morning in the end. But I was a bit worried because. We were both a bit concerned because we didn't know what sort of reception we would get. You know, we, as I said previously, we were there to watch them. And that's what they thought. You know, we're there to spy on them. We were there to say, no, you can't do that, and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, we got on, from that night, we got on really well. And I often wonder whether they were told by the OC, if yeah, these Aussies like a beer, keep them pissed. All right? Get them sweet. They'll be right. But that, that probably worked. That probably wasn't what it was, and that happened. But we made friends, you know. I got, I still got people I I'm in touch with from three in there, and they're all over the world. There aren't too many left in Zim. But uh, that was my first night there. I went down to my room. Next day, early in the morning, boss come banged on my door. I said, "Come on, we're going." And it was about three o'clock in the morning the next day. I thought, it must be must be late. That could be finished at two. Had it? Yeah. Come long story short, and uh, we the, the police inspector, the BSAP inspector, Eric Heard was there with his uh, his little Rixie taxi money car and uh, a huge, big African uh, police officer. And my boss, he said, we've got to go to Julius Dale. I said, what for? He said, because there are 15 communist terrorists coming up the road that want to go to the as to embassy assembly area at Echo. So we've got to go and meet them and make sure that no, nothing happens to them, you know, or they don't uh, start any trouble. So we met up with Inspector Heard in his little Rixie taxi car and uh, his huge African constable, um, and me and my boss. So we all four of us squeezed into this thing. You, you know what I'm talking about, those little funny Renos. And me and the, the African guy are in the back, and we've got a broom handle with a white flag nail, a white sheet nail to it, which is out the window. So we're zooming down the road, and we zoom going on, and we see this group of people down, this, down the road there, so we pull up. We all get out of the car, and I'm saying to myself, now... What's going to happen here? My rifle, I was I was in the action condition as soon as I got out in that car. I cocked my weapon, safety catch on. And when we got out, I said, uh, all right, there's more of them than us. So, you know, you've got to be ready. So I flicked us my uh, safety catch to, uh, to fire and just waited to see what was going to happen. And the African constable was also, you know, shit, what's going on here? Um, they, they come up the road. Inspector Heard and my boss, they, they stopped, and the, the lead guy is quite like, you know, quite a clean, clean looking guy, so I don't think he was a real communist terrorist. But anyway, he comes up to my boss and he goes, I've been watching too many movies. So he saluted him, and my boss saluted him, and all that sort of stuff, and they started talking. What do you want to do? Oh, we want to go to the assembly area. We've been told we need to go to the assembly area. So again, we got on the, the comms and Spoke to them, Tali, and they said, yes, no worries, we'll send the bus up. And we we got them to where they needed to go. That was the first time we had anything to do uh, with the actual job. We went back to Inyanga. Um, we were starting to get to know the the hierarchy. They were starting to understand that um, we weren't there to really stick the knife in the back or anything. Um, and over the next couple of weeks, that's what we did. We went out to back to Juliusdale at one stage where there were three trucks loads of communist terrorists all in the back of trucks uh, screaming and ululuing and carrying on that needed to go to the assembly area. And the closer it got, the, the, the ceasefire came into effect, I think it was on the 28th of December. I know it says 21st, but people were still shooting each other right up to the 28th. And it was for a week. And in that week, the communist terrorists were supposed to go to assembly areas. Anybody that wasn't there in that week become fair game. 
And because there was so much intimidation, which you know more about than I do, um, going on uh, over that period, that's when Soam said, that, all right, the Rhodesian security forces can now go back out and, uh, and find these guys that aren't playing the game. Because you know as well as I do that a good percentage of the communist terrorists in the assembly areas weren't communist terrorists at all. You know, they were just told to go there, given a weapon. You go there, we'll sit outside and watch. Um, so the closer we got to the, the date, and you know, the harder it was to actually get them to where they were supposed to be. But we got with these three trucks there. So that was the initial period of the ceasefire. That's what we were doing. We were going from point A to point B, from Yanga to wherever, meeting groups of communist terrorists and transporting them out to Elim Mission. Not the Elim Mission in the Bumba, but the one in the, 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 the northern Yanga TTL there, where my friends were. After that, things got a bit quiet. And as I said, you know, we got to know the guys that's three in there. Um, I've, I've still got people I said before that I, I maintain contact with, mainly on Facebook. They're in Canada, the UK. Some are still in Zim, a lot in, in uh, Rhodesia, in uh, South Africa. But um, we got to become friends. So we got on really well. I remember, I'll never forget New Year's Eve. Well, I've probably forgotten a lot of it, but I'll never forget it. It must have been one of their, uh, one of their, their, one of their tactics. Yeah, take him up to Trampbeck. Get a few beers into him, you know, blah, 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 so that he'd be right. So, yeah, we, we went up to Troutbeck. We had a good night there, and everybody's giving me a hard time because I'm in CMF, and it's only the first week, and all these rich people are up there having their New Year's Eve and all that sort of stuff. And saying, why aren't you wearing a camouflage uniform? Well, we were told not to take any camouflage with us. Um, we weren't allowed to look aggressive. The only thing, other than our webbing, that we could take that was even even military um, or, or, or martial was our steel helmets. They said, you can take a steel helmet, which is another story. A uh, RLI stick came into Inyanga. Uh, they, the chopper and buddy had run out of fuel or had taken a round or something, and it was a bit late to fly back to, to where their fire force base was. It must have been Grand Reef, I would imagine. So anyway, uh, we're having a beer, and they come in the boozer, and you know, we're talking away. And one of them was an Australian. Tony Young, and uh, he had uh, Australian military forces rising sun on his uh, cam camo jump seat. And I said, where'd you get that? So our Aussie mate gave it to me. I said, well, you know, it's on the wrong sleeve for a start. Oh, I don't care, mate. Oh, I don't care. So we got talking. And uh, my steel helmet was on the bar because I'd got fed up with all the war stories. And uh, these boats come back. Oh, no, no. And I'm saying, mate, next person that tells a war story, got to put my helmet on. All right? It's... Uh, there's so, so many bullets and, and bombs flying around here and knee-deep in grenade pins, you need some protection. He said, who's almost that? I said, it's mine. I said, he said, oh, can I have it? And I said, oh, I've just given it to the guys uh, last week and uh, you'll have to ask them because I've given it to them. And they said, yeah, you can have it. Because they didn't like the South African helmets you used to wear. Uh, we were using American helmets. So like, and he said, so anyway, I gave it to him. And he gave me in return three stick grenades, uh, I think I had three AK-47 magazines and a set of Chinese chest webbing with holes in it and a bit of blood, and he gave them to me. I brought them over to Australia with me. I didn't bring the grenades home. I thought that was a bit very foolish. So one of the guys, uh, Fred Bassett, Vaughan Bassett, his uh, his family lived on a farm between Inyanga and and, uh, and Rasapi, and uh, his dad had been killed. The goo killed his father just not long before that. Um, you know, Bassett was the name and he said what are you going to do with those three stick grenades I said I don't know mate I wasn't going to pull them and throw them because I didn't know which they, they told me that there are two types and a bit like our hand grenades you've got an instantaneous fuse and you've got a like, three to five second fuse like we do and they, they, were, they couldn't remember which one was which I said I'm not going to try and throw them they said oh just take the, take the bloody explosive out and make a shot, salt and pepper shaker out of them because apparently you can buy them in the shops in Salisbury I said, no, I'm not going to bother with that. So he said, I'll take them. And I said, what are you going to do with them? He said, I'm going to booby trap my farm. Because uh, as I said, his dad got killed not long before um, that. And uh, so I gave them to him. So I, I often, well, I'm, I'm not going to ask him next time I Facebook him and say, did you ever use those grenades and did you ever get a result? But uh, yeah, that's what I got for my my helmet. And I, Tony uh, Tony is in, his, in in Brisbane here. He's in Queensland. I spoke to him on the phone yesterday. 
And we were at Coolum for a, I didn't know that this was Tony at the time. We were at Coolum for a uh, Anzac day. I went up there with the RLI guys two years ago and Tony was there. We just got to talking and we realized that he was the guy that came into the pub with his stick and all that sort of stuff. He said, I've still got your helmet. I said, no, you haven't. I said, no, I haven't. He rang up his wife, said, take a photo of that steel helmet's on the fridge. And uh, okay, I suppose it was mine. It looked like mine. They all look the same. There's a million of them. So I just, I said, oh, okay, no worries. So he's going to give it back to me. But that's just a side story. After the first couple of weeks, things quietened down. And we did go out occasionally to, uh, uh, we, they captured a, a communist terrorist out near uh, Mengendoza there. And uh, they asked him where his weapons were. And he said, oh, I buried them. And so they, me and the boss and the, one of the sergeants from 3 end up went out to find them and he couldn't find them. So that was a wild goose chase. Um, we did a few trips to, to Niamaropa and down to Ruda. Um, went to Niamaropa for a, a couple of days. They stayed in the police camp there and they told us the story of when they got attacked. Um, and the, the CTs were just about into the compound when they were running out of ammunition. And the only reason they didn't get killed was because they just got a resupply in time. They chopped a resupply into them. Um, so that was quite interesting. That was like Tiger Country, you know, sitting up there. And and as we're driving along now, I think at Inyanga, they had a couple of mine incidents where they, their blokes got blown up. And there's a truck, old truck by the side of the road there, and they're pointing it out to me. So that's when the last. And we drove over the last landmine and shit like this. and Yeah, so that was quite interesting. Another interesting thing we did was uh, my boss was an engineer officer. And there weren't too many engineers in Rhodesia. And a lot of them were busy at the moment on the Cordon Sanitaire there, your, your border minefield. A waste of time they are. They had one in Vietnam. But all it, all it was was a, an explosive ammunition resupply for the enemy. They just went and got the mines out of there and blew you up with them. But anyway, they, there was no engineer around, and they'd found a mine cache down near Ruda on the, the Gairesi River. You'd know it more than I do, but it, apparently it was quite a common border crossing. So they said, you want to come down and, and pull this mine cache for us? And my boss, he was just like me. We, we like these guys. We said, yeah, no worries, we'll do it for you. So we, we off we went, a uh, section of the guys and us, stopped at the police camp at Ruda, said, good day, this is what we're here for. They sent a copper with us because he knew where it was. Drove a, a distance to the to the river, but then we had to get out and walk uh, down to the river. And uh, one of the guys said, look, this is the border between Mozambique and Rhodesia, so don't go over that side. You know? Well, if anybody comes from that side, you can shoot them. Okay, fair yeah. enough. I'm not supposed to shoot anybody, but uh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know whether you've been there or you know it, but there's a huge rock there monster rock so we're looking for somebody to hide while my boss is pulling this bloody the mines out just in case they're booby trapped it and someone said let's go behind the big rock okay so we're all hiding behind this big rock and it was only later i thought to myself you know, i was a, a communist terrorist i'd put somebody ap mines behind that big rock just in case somebody <laughs> come along found my mines and wanted to take them away but nothing happened so it was good so off we went back in the crocodile back to ruda back up to Minyanga. Um, trying to think of other things that were interesting, probably a lot, but I can't remember. Um, atrocities and, uh, and stuff like that, intimidation. We got called to there's a small hospital in Yanga uh, a couple of times. Uh, the company got called out, went down there to have a look at uh, people who had been mutilated and imitated and, and uh, intimidated. And there was women down there that they stuck many snakes up where they shouldn't be sticking them and stuff like that. These are the sorts of things that got the company base teams on side. All right, the guys in the in the bush, surrounded by uh, by uh, communist terrorists, you know, some of them started leaning towards them with their hard luck stories and their buddy Rhodesian security forces and all this sort of stuff. So there were there's two trains of thought with uh, Rhodesia, I believe, and that's the guys that were with the company base teams. We believed everything we saw because we saw it and we knew these guys were all decent guys. But the fellows in the bush had a harder time of it because, um, you know, they, they a lot in a lot of cases, they, they didn't see much Rhodesian security force presence because they weren't supposed to come near the assembly areas. And, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, it was a bit funny, that. Um, but we all turned into Rhodesians. After about a month, mate, I was wearing a pair of shorts, a T-shirt, 
Jess Webbing, which I bought at Faraday's when I was on a, a three-day uh, R&R. Uh, and this, uh, this Pommy bloke actually asked me, I was having my gear on, and I was wearing an RAR beret with an RAR badge on it, my RAR, not yours. And I think he mistook me for one of you guys. He said, how many parachute jumps have you done? I said, 40. He said, I'm 40 jumps. I said, yeah, no big deal. But he thought I'd done 40 operational jumps, so I didn't tell him otherwise. I didn't lie to him, but yeah, we were... <laughs> We were just like you guys, and like anything, if you if you spend enough time with somebody with a different accent, you pick it up. So by the time we got home, we were all talking like you. <laughs> um, so in Yanga was great. Uh, people were great. Um, we went to the casino at uh, Montclair with them one night. They took us to the casino. They showed us around. When we first got there, the first week I was there, and I started to think that this could be dangerous. I've got a rifle, I've got ammunition. And I was we were up at uh, Captain Fred Tarty's farm. He was a a reserve captain doing uh, we're doing the farm security for him for a while. And uh, the guys were changing over their ammo and I said, You got any tracer rounds? And Ian McRae, one of the guys, Pete McRae, um, said, Yeah, I've got some ammo, so can you give me a few? Because I wanted to put a couple in the first round of the magazine, one in the last, because I didn't know I had, if I want to find my rifle. I want to see where things are going. But anyway, so, you know, we had a good working relationship with you guys. When the elections came on, we had a company from, we were with a company from Fort RR, Fort RR sent D Company, I think it was, up uh, to uh, provide uh, polling station security. Um, I think the CO was the name, the guy's name was Campbell, because they all reckon his nickname was Killer Campbell. And uh, we all jumped in there vehicles and we went into the TTL to the polling station which was like an old church uh, mission school type setup well we got out and uh, we had a pop up we had a bobby with us of course the coppers had uh, the pommy coppers were there over a wander around and picking things up like the tail fins of rpgs and there's all holes in the walls and uh, bullet holes and rpg holes and things so it obviously seen a bit of trouble Anyway, we set ourselves up and the company set up this defensive position. And because I was a mortarman, the CSM said, right, you're going to be on the 60 mil mortar. And I was a buddy monitor. I wasn't supposed to be doing any of that stuff. And I still had my white monitor armband on. And I'd customised mine. I'd got the pangolin on it. I'd got the white bit. And I'd got my power wings and my two hooks. And he said, can you take that off? I said, why? He said, well, it stands out like dog's balls. And I don't want them seeing you at stand two and shooting you. So I said, okay, so I took it off. But for the, the three days we were there, I was the number two on the 60 mil mortar. I actually <laughs> fired a couple of rounds. I think that was just for fun, though. Um, so we spent that time there. Uh, the the, the uh, local population came in, they voted, and then uh, we went back to Winyanga. But a little bit of the... My, my mates were at Elim. They were... The guys from my battalion, they were at Elim. Uh, they were on the, the AP there. And they had a couple of interesting times there. About week four or five, things were getting quieter in Yanga, and uh, Captain Simpson said to me, you want to go to... I told him I wanted to go. I told my boss I wanted to go out and see my mates out at Elam. And uh, the two ways to get there, one was to drive, and that was, uh, it was a bit dangerous, they reckon. And there was a Dakota flying into there from a, a small faff at Aberdeen, which wasn't far from in Yanga. So it was arranged that I would fly on the Dakota to... Uh, to Ely Mission and uh, spend a night or two there and then come back on a, a police reserve air wing Cessna that was coming back. Oh, that was great. So anyway, off we went and uh, got on the plane and I was sitting near the door and it was full of young men. And I, th I think they were either RLI or South Africans, but they weren't saying too much. They're just looking at me, you know, staring at me, you know, they put a monitoring for sky. Can we, can we throw him out at 300 feet and all that sort of stuff? <laughs> and, uh, the lady comes down the back and he's got a wedge of wood. And they shut the door and he says, mate, he's wedged the wood in behind the handle. He said, your job is to make sure that don't come out. Don't vibrate out the door, fall off. Well, okay. So anyway, so we flew to uh, Elim. Uh, the guy that's come and picked me up. Drove me down to the DC camp at Elim Mission. And... Uh, you know, went in and said good day. And I had two Rhodesian grenades in my webbing. The guys had given me a frag grenade and a white boss. I don't know why, you know, but we didn't know what was going to happen, but I carried them anyway. And as soon as the CSM there, my mate saw, we were friends for a long time, Jack Selms and I, 
these two grenades. He didn't like the look of them, so he wouldn't let me bring my webbing into the CP. He said, you put that over there about 150 metres away, so I had to leave my webbing there. And I did a bit of a walk around. There's a lot of bunkers there. I don't know whether you've been to Elim Mission in the northern Yanga TTL, not the one at the Bumba, where they, where they massacred all those, those people. But there are a lot of bunkers there. And they were just about ankle deep in uh, 7.62 um, cases. And they showed me the rocks up on the hills there. They were all painted different colours. And they painted them different colours, apparently, because that's the firing positions that the CTs used to use if they revved the, the camp. And uh, you know, they, it was good for a fire control order, for example, you know, red rock or white rock or whatever. Um, so it was pretty it was pretty um, hairy out there. And the, what really made my mate angry was when the DAC flew over the, the, the CT camp, they all panicked. You know, they saw a DAC and all they could think of was you guys. You know, oh, shit, the fire force is coming in to clean us all up. So they got all upset and they turned all their weapons on the monitors. And they had everything up to 20 mil cannons in there, 20 mil ready, or 12.7s and all that sort of stuff. So when I got in there, it was fairly tense. And uh, the, the, the head of the, the guerrillas or the CTs in the camp there was there arguing with the, the OC, who was a pommy. Um, Green Howard's guy. Yeah, Green Howard's no... Um, I don't remember what regiment it was. Anyway, Captain. He was a nice guy. I met him in Australia a bit later. I was his, I was his uh, umpire sig. He'd come over for an exercise. Green jackets. But, uh, green jackets, that's it. And, uh, you know, they're, 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 what, what's going on here, you know? And, and Jack says to me, he said, did you fly in on that bloody Dakota? And I said, yes. He said, well, you could have got us all killed. I said, why? He said, well, these blokes think they're your blokes, and they're going to come and money. They're going to jump out, and they're all going to be dead. So that was interesting. Uh, spend the night there with them, and they, they lived in primitive conditions the whole time. They were living in tents, hutches, sleeping on stretchers the whole three months. And our government, as far as they're concerned, there was nothing dangerous about Rhodesia for us. They consider our deployment there to have been just a deployment. We did a good job. They're happy with that. But um, all the guys that were there um, who knew how dangerous it was, and it often came fairly close to you know, people being killed but weren't killed. You know, we're, we're pissed off about that. We think that, uh, that we should be, have a little bit more recognition. We don't want a chest full of medals, but um, we got guys now that are suffering um, ailments that quite, could quite easily have been caused by, well, you know how Rhodesia was. You get Bill Halsey, you get the, all these other funny things that don't happen to you until you get later on in life. Now, I don't really mind it, but I'm really pissed off that our government don't consider what we did to be to be dangerous. No. We had a reunion not long ago where uh, one of the guys from Canberra, from DHAT, he said, the only thing you guys did wrong was nobody got killed. He said they expected, there was an expectation before we left of at least six, maybe more uh, fatalities. But everybody did their job, you know, kept their cool, cooled down any situations that came up. And we all got home. So, yeah. So we're back in Yanga. We, we, we weren't there long. We had managed to have a few beers with the four RR guys, have a game of cricket. And uh, then it was all over. Once the results were in, it was all over. And uh, the day that the results came in, we grabbed all our gear. We left a lot behind. Uh, we jumped on a bus, drove to uh, a roadhouse on the way to... Umtali, on the way to Umtali and Salisbury, the bus picked us up, all the other guys were on there. They, they looked at me when I got on the bus, I had a t-shirt on, chest webbing, pistol was stuck in a shoulder of a holster. Yeah, <laughs> bell scoons, took one look and they went, shit mate, what's happened to you? But I wasn't the only one. Most of us guys that were with the Rhodesian Security Forces, in the end, we'd have all, if you won that, if you'd have won that election, we would have stayed. We wouldn't have got us back. But anyway, yeah. that's another story. Uh, back to Salisbury, big parade, you know, our General Ackland banging on about you know, well done men, all that sort of stuff. But while we were sitting in the roadhouse, I can't remember where it was. It might have been Rasapi, I'm not sure. There, we could hear a huge cheer. And I said to someone, what's that? And they said, it's all the buddy Africans cheering Mugabe's victory. Yeah, okay. So we jumped on the bus, went back to Salisbury, spent the night there, back on the plane back to Australia. And uh, yeah, that was it. 
it wasn't a long period of time. It was only 12 weeks. But I think about Rhodesia every day. I talk to Rhodesian friends every day, maybe not face-to-face, -face, but on Facebook. And I'll, I've spoken to Tony Young already this morning. His wife, unfortunately, died two days ago. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's only a small part of my life, but it's a big part. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, we, all, we all feel for what happened. Yeah. yeah. Every one of us, even the guys that were, were looking after the, the, the communist terrorists. In fact, another interesting side story before I finish, the guys at England Mission got blamed for a bus ambush um, that happened on the main main road there. Um, the communist terrorists ab ambushed a bus, killed about 17 Africans, and in the ambush site, they left the body behind. All right? I don't know what happened to him, but in his uh, gear, he had a, a box of matches that you can only get in an Australian Army ration pack. You know, it's like a normal box of matches with a, with a kangaroo and the cross rifles on it, the green thing. And they found that on him. So quite rightly, they, they deduced that uh, these guys were hiding in the AP at Elon and just going out when they felt like it and, um, you know, making a nuisance of themselves. So the guys at uh, the, the, the monitoring force came under fire there because um, they said, you're not doing your job properly. But how can 15 men monitor 5,000 other men? You know, it just wasn't really right. You guys should have taken advantage of the situation while you had a more than one spot. But the trouble is, you know, it's it's most people are of the opinion that a lot of the a lot of the guys that were in there weren't real communist terrorists. They were there to make up the numbers. Yeah. But um, yeah, well, that come close. And uh, the company that I was with at, in Yanga, three N, that they sent a platoon. Or a patrol to monitor the the uh, the AP at Echo, and uh, they got sprung by the the real CTs found them, or well, the Majibas found them and dumped them in, and they had to they withdraw from their position. And they, I think they left a couple of Mag 58s behind, but I'm not sure about that. Rob Page wrote to me about it, and he said uh, basically he said if if, if Mugabe hadn't won that election, he said we'd all be pushing up daisies. But I don't know, but that's. I've probably forgotten a lot. I've, got a, I've made some notes here, but I wouldn't look at that. But, um, yeah, I've probably forgotten a lot, but that's pretty much what my review yeah. is like. It's funny how sometimes, I'll probably cut this out, but it's funny how sometimes um, you have particular memories, like you were talking about Trout Beck. Um, oh, and yeah. I have... I have one memory of going to Trout Beck that really has always stuck in my mind because it was so surreal. And that was in November 1975. Um, I'd just done my SAS selection course uh, in Inyanga in those days mm -hmm. with Captain Goth Barrett and 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 uh, Sergeant. I've never met them, but I've read them obviously. Yeah. I know what you're talking about yeah. and, and Sergeant Daryl Watt and Corporal Skippers. But anyway, um, I'll never forget the final leg us arriving at Inyangombi campsite. Now we we had basically five days or a week uh, of of uh, schlepping around Mount Inyangombi and you know uh, the Pungui Gorge and all that kind of thing, and uh, and we hadn't you know we hadn't had a bath for for a week. We were we were exhausted. We were half starved. We were we stank to high heaven because it it drizzled or rained the whole time. So <laughs> our clothes were sort of uh, moldy. Yeah. And uh, and and at the end of the selection, um, I had to produce. I think I had three big rocks, which had been signed by Daryl Watt and Sergeant Watt. Told me I had to produce the rocks at the end of the selection. Of course, these were all given for you know punishment, yeah. and and he he'd signed them with a cokey pen, so he checked his signature on the rock. They were they were the genuine rocks. I didn't replace them or anything. And then and then uh, we were we were separated. Yeah, we were separated from the other guys who had not passed the selection. Uh, we weren't allowed to look at them. They weren't allowed to look at us. We had, to, had nothing to do with them. And then uh, uh, Mr. Barrett, uh, Garth Barrett, told us to, Captain, I think he was in those days, told us to uh, climb on onto a, one of those Sabre um, uh, Land Rovers. And off we went oh, okay. to, we went to, um, and we were still dirty. We hadn't even, you know, 
changed our clothes or anything. We went to um, Troutbeck Hotel. Yeah. And we were marched. We were marched in there. We had to check in our rifles at at the yeah, reception yeah. desk. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, and and we sat down at this table with all these uh, civilians dressed, women dressed in evening gowns, and you know, yeah. ties on. And and we had this waiter with a white with a white uh, um, you know yeah. uh, sort of yeah. serviette yeah. and and a red fez. I think he had and white gloves or whatever. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And we had to order from this menu, you know. It was, and we were drinking French champagne. I mean, the whole thing was just unbelievably weird. The candlelight, the champagne, you know, yeah. the, the 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 food, and you know, the desserts, and and all these finely dressed people, and you had these stinking, filthy <laughs> SAS wannabes. You know, uh, I'll never forget that memory. It's stuck in my mind. <laughs> when the three end up guys took me up the trap back and they're all in uniform and I'm in mine, but we were clean. So that wasn't, <laughs> that but it reminds me of a story. I, I got on a shilok. I was flying back to do another parachute course from an exercise area and uh, we were on this Chinook and I had been out in the bush for three weeks. So we didn't shower. We'd get away with it either. No one wanted to have a shower because once you got clean, you got weak. And when we were dirty, we felt strong. So here I am, I've got my cam cream on and I've got my rifle and all that sort of stuff. And I get on the plane, it's all the offices with briefcases. They're all in the headquarters guys up at uh, Sam Hill. And I stank like buggery. I looked, I was dirty. Uh, the, the, the Chinook was full up, so they couldn't move away from me, but you could see them bleeding away. And we're taken off and, and we were going a fair way. And because it was a helicopter, you know, and it, it was flying to Amelie, which is the air base, which is about 60 kilometers south of Brisbane. We're all going to Brisbane. We're all going to Anagra. We used to land helicopters on the playing field, go up in them, fly out and jump out of them. So I said, uh, why are we going to Amelie? Are all you officers going to Anagra? And they said, yeah, we're all going to Anagra. I said, well, why aren't we going to Amelie? He said, I don't know. I said, why don't you go and ask the pilot if we can change and we'll all get out of Anagra and we're there, we're home. And they looked at each other and there's fucking captains and colonels and shit there. And, yeah. So one of the guys went up and said to the pilot, hey, mate, can you drop us off at Anagra? Yeah, why not? It's on the way. So he come out and said, okay, fellas, we're going to Anagra. But they still wouldn't sit close to me. <laughs> <laughs> they were all high-ranking officers. They would have flown all the way to Amberley, got some of their buddy peasants to drive out in a staff car to pick them up and take them to Anagra. Yeah. I couldn't work out why they didn't have a look at it and say, well, why aren't we going through there? Yeah. Anyway, another story. Thank oh, you so much. Yeah, it finishes me, John. Nice to see your face. Um, I just want to make you want to want to make sure that the guys watching this, because I I, I comment on several Rhodesian uh, Facebook pages, and uh, I I quite often, not often, but every now and again, you'll get someone come back and have a go at you because we were part of the problem. We were part of why there is no longer a Rhodesia. So I don't want people thinking that I I I was. Over there fighting a war, I was just over there doing my job. Yeah, thank you, Bill. That was an interesting story. Much appreciated. Okay. Yeah.